Welcome and thank you everybody for joining Litnock for another monthly event. Today we are going to present uh, Michael Kennedy is going to be doing Billing Rich Input Forms in ASP.NET MVC. Uh, but before I hand over to Michael, I'm just going to do a bit of housekeeping as usual. First thing is, uh, our sponsor list has grown a little bit since last time, for those that haven't been around, and the uh, reason for that uh, it will become apparent in just a minute. But I want to say thank you very much to both Altsweb, Telerik, Thinkpad, Inner Workings, Pluralsight, Redgate, Submain, Syncfusion, Winselect, and Winselect now for all of the support you guys have given us and have assisted us in the last couple of months and ooh, for some of them a couple of years now. Uh, to make these kind of events and other things possible. Some housekeeping, as I said, uh, if you have any questions regarding our events or anything else Lidnock related, uh, feel free to email us at info at .org. You can also catch us on the social at twitter.com slash Lidnock or facebook.com slash Lidnock. And all of our events are recorded, as you may have noticed, and they will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, and that's youtube.com slash litnock. Also, our website is bit.ly slash litnock. Now, a big announcement we've been talking about for the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, for you, those, those of you that are Litnock members. Um, but we want to announce a global Windows 8 Cold contest, and this is a uh, Litnog in association with Inner Workings. This is a four week long challenge, uh, it has 19 challenges in it. Literally, we have hundreds of prizes and potentially thousands of cold monkeys participating. We're utilizing Inner Workings uh, developer interface to track and also uh, hold on to the scores for the leaderboard. Uh, as it goes, uh, week one, there will be new channels released. Uh, at the end of week one, we will be picking the winners from uh, from the leaderboard, and they will be giving a handful of licenses and products, uh, including both LinkPad Pro and Submain Code Uh Week two, uh, Inner Workings, uh, an annual subscription, like that Pro, Submain Code Write, and Ant Performance Profile licenses will be given out, and again, new channels will be released. Um, and that's going to go on for four weeks until we have the final Code Comp winner who will get a ton of licensing. Um, now, everybody that registers and participates will receive a Submain Code Pro license at the end of the competition. The competition ends on the 12th of July. You can join at any given time. Uh, obviously, you cannot win the week one prizes if you join in week two. Uh, but that being said, the competition is now open. And this, this is not an arbitrary we select who wins. There is a leaderboard. Uh, and I'll now tell you how you're going to be uh, participating. First up, step one is to register. Go to uh, hbbit.ly slash codecomp, uh, register. Uh, if you don't have Visual Studio, you can also download a trial. It's a bit.ly slash vs2012 trial. It takes you to the Visual Studio 2012 Ultimate 90-day trial. This is a Windows 8, so you obviously need to have Windows 8 installed. Once you register, you will be presented with the developer interface download from Inner Workings. So register, download, and install it. Once you've installed it and you've um, and you're ready to go, you log in. You go to the achievements tab in the developer interface. You go to My Competitions. You select the Global Windows 8 Code Jam competition. You choose the country that you want to represent, and you start coding. Uh, a few rules. Um, you don't have to be a Linux member to participate. That's quite all right. You can be a Linux member or a non Linux member and participate, but you have to be a Linux member if you want to win anything. 
And it's very simple to become a little member. You go to bit.ly slash libdoc. And yes, it's free. Um, another thing is also, if you have any questions or you have problems, you can blame Brian. Email him at brian.madsen at libdoc.org. Some upcoming events. Uh, of course, we have a big event coming in July, early July. Uh, Scott Castro is back for his 16th uh, open Q&A session. Um, for those of you that haven't been in these before, we're talking about him spending 90 minutes answering all manner of questions from the participants in here. Uh, we have a ton of, our, ton of more um, events coming up as well, including more from Michael Kennedy and the guys at Developmentor. Uh, but enough of that, go to linuxevents.eventbride.com and you can see the next couple of months' events. Just to introduce uh, Mike Kennedy, he's a net enthusiast, uh, slash code guru. This is his first Linux event. Um, he's a Microsoft certified trainer and he's a founder of chatpass.com. He's obviously also a presenter and he's also the technical curriculum director for developmental. And today we're going to see building rich input forms in ASP.NET MVC. Martin, thank you very, very much for uh, stepping up and coming and presenting for our audience. I'm going to hand over to you okay. now. All right, great. So I will turn on my screen sharing, everybody, and then we'll get started. Excellent. Here we go. All right. So thank you, Brian and Lidnug, for having me. And thank you, everybody, for coming. I think we have a really interesting topic here with rich input forms with ASP.NET MVC. It has a little bit of something for everybody. If you're brand new to ASP.NET MVC, there's going to be enough that I think you'll get a lot out of it. And if you are moderately to... Uh, let's just say moderately experienced with ASP.NET MVC, there's still a, a couple of great tricks I'm going to show you here and there that I think will be useful. Uh, so hopefully it spans the spectrum of experiences and so on. So like Brian said, I'm from Developmentor. Uh, here's my Twitter and my blog, website, that sort of thing. If you want to uh, get in touch with me, feel free to contact me one of those ways. Uh, the... Um, the code that we build in here, I'll make that available for you to download. And currently, I already put these slides into the um, the shared handouts or whatever it's called. It's a little uh, like multi-page looking thing in the top right. So you can download those as well as the introduction lid nug stuff, which had the the uh, code challenge on there. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and get started now. What you'll see in this presentation is mostly demos. I don't want to spend a lot of time, you know, talking about theory. Right? I think the way you learn this stuff is through hands-on. So what we're going to do is we're going to build an application. We'll implement one part of it, come back, talk about it a little bit. We'll implement another part, maybe refine what we did. So make way for the demos. That's my message. All right, so if you look at ASP.NET MVC, I believe that this is a very successful platform, and it's just been picking up speed and picking up speed. You know, the very beginning, it started a little bit slow, but it's, it's really rolling now. And I think one of the really powerful and powerful features and things they got really right when they built MVC is this whole how do you take input from the user and post that back and validate that and things like that. So input forms are, are a really high point of MVC, in my opinion. And there's, a, there's about six or seven different features that all come together to make that happen, and that's what's in this list. So the fact that you have strongly typed views, unlike, say, web forms or many other, other web frameworks, you take a class and you sort of, in some sense, you know, represent the properties in a strongly typed way on, on that form using these things called HTML helpers. And then after you get that set up, the, the sort of web infrastructure does something called model binding, where it automatically maps the form data into your class data or your uh, parameter data. And on top of this, we have a lot of interesting validation. So we you do... There's a bunch of ways we can do validation, but sort of the preferred way is to use attributes from the data annotations namespace. So we have this sort of declarative validation, and there's additional um, integration with um, some client-side scripts that add unified client-side and server-side validation without any additional work. So that's really excellent. We'll look at that. 
when you build real websites that have lots of composite data, you know, it's very common to have a page that has aggregate data. So we're going to build a bookstore. Maybe our bookstore has information about the user, like your shopping cart or something like that, whether you're logged in, has information about like a book category, what category you're in, maybe the books that are in the category, maybe the page, if you have page nation turned on, all those kinds of things. And, and you need to pass that set of data around. So we'll see we're going to leverage this concept called view models to sort of group data, to integrate validation, as well as to prevent some potential potential hacking attempts on our site, depending on what kind of site we're building, that may or may not be a problem. Because in MVC, we get to control the HTML that comes out almost 100%, it's a very JavaScript-friendly environment. So that means that if we want to do nice JavaScript types of interactions instead of full postbacks for our forms, you know, this is the, the right place to do it. And I'll just really briefly mention something called a SPA or single page applications. You know, that's a little bit more advanced, but all the things that we're talking about sort of, you know, lead in this direction as well. Okay, so that sort of sets the stage for where we're going to go. We're going to talk about these different things. But the first thing that we need to talk about is how do you interact with your pages? So if you're coming from a web forms perspective or potentially other other uh, types of frameworks, you you have this sort of I load up a page through a GET request, and the user maybe has a form on there, and they interact with it. And that form posts back to the same URL. And then you interact with it somewhere, and it posts back again. So think of web forms as I would like click around, say, a, a calendar, or change a, um, a combo box, and that might change some other part of the page. But if you were to hit F5, it would pop up this warning dialog. If you were to refresh the page, it would pop up this warning dialog. It will it'll say something to the effect of confirm page submission or some form submission, something to that effect, you get this big scary warning. And so sort of to deal with that issue as well as just things are much simpler in the MVC world, we have this alternate way of doing things. Rather than having a single page that always talks back to itself, we have this get post redirect pattern. Okay, so let's suppose we have a book in a bookstore, we're gonna edit it. The user comes along here and they do a get. And here the CR, you can see the URL book, edit 42. So that's going to show the details in a form of the book as a get request. Then the user is going to edit it. They're going to you know, maybe change the name or the price or, or whatever. And they're going to say save. That's going to do a post back to the same URL, including the change, and it'll pass the changes along. But instead of just staying on that page, we would probably go and, you know, take you back to the, the read-only view of that book or something like that. So this is a very, very common, this get post redirect pattern, and we'll see how to control it with um, attributes and action methods and those kinds of things in MVC. So this might be a little bit hard for you to read, and I apologize if it is. We'll see it in code in just a second, okay? So here's we got add book. This is going to create a, a new book rather than edit a book. Same basic thing. And you can see the, the get one, we have HTTP get on our action method, that attribute. And that means it only responds to get requests. Now we have another add book down here, and it has different parameters. It has a class that we're mapping to through model binding. We'll get to that. All right? Here, this is a string ID. This is a book. And this has the post. So this is the one that only responds to post requests. So we do a little bit of validation. Step three, we update the book with the data and we save it. And then four, we redirect maybe to the category to which we added the book, something like that. Okay, so this is how this get post redirect pattern looks in code. And actually, it's, it's popular enough that somebody went and created a Wikipedia post on it. They, they refer to it slightly differently, post redirect get, but you know, I, don't, I don't see it that way, so I switched the order of the words, but basically it's the same thing. Okay, so let's talk about the app we're about to build. So if you guys have ever seen the movie Coming to America with Eddie Murphy, there's this guy who builds something kind of like McDonald's, but it's not McDonald's. So we're going to do something like that with bookstores. So we're going to build Amazon, right? Something very similar to Amazon, but not exactly the same. And our Amazon is going to be much simpler, as you can imagine. We're going to have books, and we're going to have categories and comments on books and, and things like that. So that's what we're going to do for uh, the rest of the day. Now, looking at the data model, um, we've got just a few objects in our data model. Things are pretty simple. So we have a book, and they've got a few things like an image URL, a name, and a price, 
right? We've got a category which has an array of books as well as um, these two fundamental properties. And we have um, a comment that can be applied to a book. Okay, so here like a book has a list of comments. So this is the data that we're going to be working with. And sometimes we'll have to work with books, sometimes categories, sometimes we'll have to use this view model as an aggregation of those sorts of things. So let's start from the beginning just to make sure everybody's on the same page. We want to create a, a view and we want to somehow associate that with a class. So this is what a uh, action method in MVC, basically a page request, looks like in the controller, for those of you who are not uh, super familiar with MVC. And we're going to create this show and comment D show uh, object here, and we're going to pass it to the view this way. And the way that surfaces over in the view is we have an at model directive that tells uh, the page what type of object it's sort of bound to. Okay, and that'll let us interact with all the forms and so on. So, first thing we need to do is go and look at our Amazon. Enough slides for now. Let's go and run our Amazon bookstore here. You can see it's not going to do very much in the beginning. It's not even going to come to the front of the page. Okay, let me zoom in for you guys as well a little bit so you can make sure you see well. All right, so here's our home page, and we want to just sort of show the categories. If we go and look at our, our code, we don't have any categories yet. Okay, so let's go to, uh, let's go to the home controller. That's this, this initial request here. So our first thing to do is add a, convert our regular view to a strongly typed view, and then we'll go and start adding forms and input and so on. Okay, so we have this data access layer. You maybe noticed in the previous slide this is actually talking to MongoDB, but it doesn't really matter. You could think of it as talking to anything. So we'll go and create that. And here, we're going to get some categories. Maybe I'll leave that here so you guys know what we're up to. So I'll say var cats categories. And I can just say all categories dot to array. Okay, so now I have an array of categories. And I want to pass these along, right? Just like you saw in, in there. Now, because I already have a view, you can see down here in views home, there's an index already. But suppose that wasn't here. Suppose I was starting from scratch. I'll show you guys a little, little trick that will get us started. Let's call this index2. Now, you can just right-click here and say add view. And it comes up with this nice dialog that will let you, you know, choose the right name. You can say a strongly typed view. It will list off all the things. So we could say, like, this is going to be a book or something like that. And it will all go ahead and create everything just like this. And if you have ReSharper, you can actually... Um, do a few uh, little tricks there as well. Now, what I actually passed, just to make this accurate, was a book array. As you can see, it was complaining down here. Okay. So, yeah, that should be good. Okay, so what we want to do actually is pass a category array. Oh, yeah, this is a category, uh, category array versus the book arrays. Don't worry about it. This is not really where you go. I'm just going to show you how to create that. So what we want to do is go to our view here. So let's go down to our view and go and add the model directive. So we'll say at model, maybe less model, model. Um, this is going to be a category array. Now, we don't know that namespace, but ReSharper will let us you know, fill it out. So then down here, we can do something uh, like this. Let's say inside this div, we'll say at for each um, well, uh, it's a category, category C in model. We've got to import that namespace as well. Okay. And then we can work with this, right? We have use the at symbol in Razor, and we can output the name and image, and I may have a shared view. Yeah, so let's say um, we're going to use this helper thing, uh, whoops, html.partial. We're going to say um, single category. My intelligence would work. Okay. So this is going to pass the model C up here, right? No forms yet, but we're just about there. Let's go ahead and run this and see if we got it right. Now, notice, this is something that drives me crazy, but I left it this way just to point it out to you guys. Notice that I was editing this form, this CSHTML razor file. And when I try to run it, I get this. Like, somehow the MVC projects don't know about MVC. 
uh, in terms of like how that integrates with the web, which is kind of strange to me. So if you go to your project properties, web, and just click start specific page and leave it empty, and you run it again, then there's no problem. It always goes to the right place. Okay, so here we go. We went, hit our NoSQL database, pulled out our one and only category that we have in here, this science category. Okay, so you can kind of see where we're going. I see there's a question. Go ahead, Brian. Yep. It says, uh, it's from Andre. He's asking, is ViewBag a little slower than view data because of the dynamic use? ViewBag versus view data. Oh, boy. You know, I would say there's... There's not much of a difference there. I mean, there is, a, so basically the question result revolves around if we're not using either of those, by the way, right now, but we could be, be working with this uh, view bag, which we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. And you can, it's a dynamic object. So if I wanted to add um, you know, page title, I could just make up stuff and go in here and say the title, okay? Or, I could come down here and I could use an older way of view data of quote page title like this and I could add that, right? So those are basically equivalent statements. This is just a MVC three and above nicer way to say the same thing. The, the performance around this I would think is quite small. Like there's a dynamic lookup here, but I think effectively, I mean, you're doing a dictionary lookup underneath the covers, and I suspect that that's the main overhead. So I would guess they're about the same. But that said, we're not doing either of those, right? We're passing a strongly typed object through the model property, in which case that should be I, – I wouldn't worry about performance between these three things. I would worry more about type safety, tooling, those kinds of things. Right. And we'll see, there's a place for view bag or view data, take your pick. But it's, it's not necessarily here. Okay. I see there's another question. Yes, I was just, Craig is mentioning that you can't use test the view bag to make sure it is uh, populated correctly. Most people put these lookups in the view model. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So it is, it's true that if you put that in into the view bag, you're going to have a harder time unit testing it. I suspect you probably could still get it out and try, but you're, you're better off doing this because the return value actually contains this array. Um, you can cast this to a view result of category array, in which case then you can unit test those properties strongly typed. You're better off doing that, yeah. Okay, so great. So nothing we've done actually has anything to do with forms, but I wanted you guys to see how the model, the strong typing, that kind of stuff works. And so now let's move on. So here we have this category. Maybe I want more categories. Well, how do I do that? So down here we have this admin section, and we can create a new category and then create a new book. So let's start with create new categories. Now you can see this is not super compelling. We need to create a form to create a category. So let's go and look at that. Let's switch over here, and that's going to be in the admin controller. And you can see the fine bit of software that I wrote here. Add category, form to create category. So what we need to do is we need to create a view. We need to create some objects that we're going to work with. Now, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to start out with this get post redirect pattern. So let's do the get part. And just to make it clear what we're doing, I'm going to say HTTP get here. So because in my mind, when I look at this code, I want to know, okay, this is the get part of the, the whole model bit. Okay, so forget this. This is just to make it compile and work. What we want to do is create this form. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to create a category object. Now, we just say return view of category. Now, you could actually skip this sort of new step, but if your class constructor sets some defaults that are not empty, you know, you might, you might be able to pass some initial data or something like that. Okay. We'll see that we'll actually need to initialize, uh, when we create a book, the various categories that they could use. So there's some reason that you might do this. Okay. Now, don't worry about this little error. This is just a uh, sharper which uh, is not quite set up on my VM. Okay, so here you can see ReSharper is telling us there is no view. So we can right-click and say Add View, or if you're in ReSharper, you can hit Alt-Enter and choose this bottom line, Create 
you know, add view via Visual Studio. And if you give it a moment, it'll actually pre-populate this here uh, as well as that. And that is a strongly typed thing. So everything sort of gets set up with one click. Now, here we have our add new category bit. And we need to create a form. We could go like this. We could say angle bracket form, you know, action equals whatever, right, the, the page that we're going to post back to and all that. But in MVC, we don't do that because we have a lot of tooling. And initially, the tooling doesn't look like it helps very much, but it looks funky if you're used to the web, but not the, the helpers. However, as we add on these things, declarative validation, client-side validation, all these kinds of things, right, you'll want this to be here because it all kind of builds on each other. So you start building forms by saying at using and create a using block. And in here, we use this thing called HTML. This is the HTML helper. We say begin form. And if you want to post back to the same URL, you just leave it empty, basically. You can customize a bunch of stuff about this, but we'll leave it. And at the bottom, we'll need a button that says um, create category. All right, and maybe we could set its type to submit, although technically it's not necessary. Now, in here, we want to have various pieces of data. So let's have something like a div for the, the name. So we'll say... Um, category name, like this. And then we can just say, this won't come out super good in formatting, but we'll just say at HTML dot um, text box for. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to create a text box that is somehow bound to the name property of our model. All right, so if I say at model, it has a name and a price and an image URL. Those are the things that I want to set. Oh. Of course, I chose this wrong category. So it has a name and an image URL that we want to set. So somehow I want to get a text box that's bound together, and if there's any validation stuff, I kind of want to apply that to the text box. So the way you do that is you say html.textbox4, and then you give it a Lambda expression that it sort of understands. So you say, given a model, what property do you want to work with? Name, like this. Okay. And that's all you got to say. So let's do the one for um, image URL as well, because we have a nice little picture. We'll say like that. Okay. So let's run it and see what we get. So if we go over here to admin, and we pick uh, add a new category, now you can see we have a not so nicely spaced out uh, form here, we would use CSS on this to make this nicer. I can do just one really quick thing. I guess we could go in here and put this into a span with a style equals display inline block min width is 100 or something like that if you really want to make it look a little nicer. Mark, I have a quick question here. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the question is, how do you decide if a product needs to be an MVC as opposed to web forms? Is there, if there is a threshold, if they need to determine that it's going to be overkill in MVC? Sure. Is there? So, so should you use MVC or should you use web forms? Um, that's a great question. If you have a product that's been around for like five years and you've got a ton of people who already know it, I would not go and just jump right into changing it, right? Now, I think if you have a new one, the choice really comes down to who is the team working on it? Are they comfortable with the web? So for what I mean by that is if I'm in web forms, I can go to this toolbox over here, and there's like hundreds of things I can do. Right. I can drop a calendar, I can drop like a, a list or whatever with postback. You can see what you can do in MVC is um, it's not super overwhelming. Those are the things that you can do, and they're just input buttons and boxes and stuff. They're basic HTML, and you don't use them anyway. You would use these HTML helpers like this text box 4 that I talked about. So what I would say is, you know, is the team sort of a good match for MVC? And... You know, are they interested in it? So that's that's what I would say, right? Um, my personal preference is it seems like software is much more maintainable. Websites are more maintainable. 
and architecturally sound when they're built with MVC. So I have a bias towards MVC, and plus I just like uh, HTML better than I do like controls that I gotta fight if they're not doing what I'm doing. So I, I would say that that's the, the trade-off. It's you know sort of it depends I guess <laughs> is the, the standard answer. All right, so let's go and run this really quick now. There's some interesting stuff to have happen here. So I can put in a name and a ACP, whatever. And I hit create, and you're going to get not just, <clears throat> excuse me, not just something that wasn't created, but not found. Well, you can look at the URL. It's admin, add category. Let's switch over here and look at our controller. Well, there is an add category, but remember we said the get. So what we need to do is distinguish between showing the form and processing the form submission. Now, if I leave this off, both of those would run the same one. That would be wrong. So let's use our, our get post redirect pattern. So now here we can go and say this is the post. Okay, that's cool. Um, we're going to do something different here. But you can see C Sharp is unhappy with us, right? So there's a couple of things we could do. We could say string name, string image URL. And let me just uh, return content of name. Let's just say that. All right, so that's just going to show text in the page. Let's repost this. We should just see that there. Um, that's not very compelling because I wrote a name. This will be, um, let's say, uh, physics or something like that. You can see it says physics up here. So what just happened? So I typed physics in this name field, and I said, oh, I have this is actually this property or parameter called name. That's the model binding part of this whole thing. So if you guys have done web forms before, you would write code like this, and this would like make you go play in traffic. It's not fun. Um, let's say category C, and then you say you new it up, right? You say C dot name equals text box. Uh, you know, it should be like text box name, but it's always like text box 17 dot text C dot image URL text box. 19.txt, right? All this junk backwards and forwards you got to set here that you did in web forms is just gone, and it's all sort of automated through model binding, right? So here, this is automatically set. So we could create a, a category and set these things, but we can go farther than that. We can actually just save this with model binding. We can say there's actually a class here, and we can just say category.name. And what it's going to do is NBC will create this class and say, well, what properties does it have and what properties does my form have? Does it have a name? Great, I'm going to set it. Does it have uh, a image URL? So does the form? Great, I'm going to set it. So now if I run this again and I repost this, you should see something super impressive like physics, but computed the other way. All right, same thing, but using this model binding at the higher level. So this is really cool. So let's do this. Let's go and create our repository object. This is our data access. Let's go and save it. So here I'm going to create a category. The category is already set. So I'll just say repository.save category. And instead of return, I'm going to do my redirect part. I'm going to return a redirect to slash, um, let's just go slash home. That will show us our categories that are in there. And you should see this new category appear. So let's go do that. Okay, so here we have science. Notice there's only one category, and its name is science. Add category. This is going to be physics. Here's Cabell. And now we need to give it a proper picture. So you, of course, do that by searching for a lolcat. Lolcat physics. There we go. So once we find a proper one, for example, um, this one looks good right here. Let's go with this one. Copy, whoops, let's copy the real image. Copy image URL. There we go. All right, so now we go create it. Bam, we have physics cat prefers to sit on something soft, physics. So you guys saw it. Now if I refresh the page, I don't get that evil warning, oh my gosh, are you sure you want to resubmit this and create another category called physics? No, we don't, because we have this get post redirect pattern, right? Get goes here, shows us the form, we post it back, and then we redirect over here when we're done. So that's sort of the like level one of forms in MVC. So we create these objects, we use the HTML helper class over here. 
Oops, over here. We say HTML text box for if you want a, a multi-line text box, you say text area. There's all sorts of stuff. You can say um, drop down list for, check box for, right? There's all the different controls that you might have dragged and dropped and give them a name and all the web form stuff. There's basically equivalents. Like this is your new HTML dot is your new toolbox, I would say. Okay, so let's go back to the slides really quick. Um, actually, let's just keep going. There's one uh, one sort of natural thing that we want to do here. So it's simple enough to create these categories, and here's the books in the categories. But let's go and uh, do something a little more advanced. Let's go create a book. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to create a book, but books only belong in categories. So this is a slightly more advanced variant, and let's start out doing this what I would almost go far, so far as to say the wrong way. Uh, but you can certainly make a case that it's a suboptimal way, okay? So again, we're going to have this HTTP uh, get and an HTTP post version. Post, okay, and I'm just going to put an X for a moment just to make this compile, okay? We'll come back and do something here in a moment. So in this one, this is going to show a form for adding a book. Well, let's just start out and try, okay, we're going to do the same thing as before, book, B, new book, return view of B. Great. And let's use ReSharper to generate this here. Okay, so add new book. So we're going to add a new book. And just like before, we're going to have a form, uh, say using uh, HTML dot begin form. Post back to the same place is fine. We have a button just like before. You can kind of see this is getting tedious already. Uh, create book. And we'll actually, actually have those other types of things. Let me just copy a little bit here. So I have a little spacing so things line up more nicely. Okay, so here we're going to have a, let's call it name. And we're going to go for, you know, this works as well because the book and categories both have name. And we're going to have an image URL. Let's just say uh, image. But we also have another thing. We have price. And this is a uh, floating point number, but it can convert it just fine back and forth to text. You don't have to do, like, float.pars and all that stuff like you would in web forms. Okay, so here this looks great. However, if I run it, there's something missing. So let's go down here to admin, create book. So a book has to belong in a category. And a category has to already exist. So what I need is some kind of like drop down list or, or something like that that I can use to specify the, the category and let them select an existing category, science or physics from the ones that we already have in the database. So, so I need to pass additional data. And you heard the question earlier about view bag. So view bag is kind of like this way to just pass stuff. What I could do, if I wanted to be wrong, and we'll go ahead and do this in the beginning, I'll say um, categories equals, and now I can go to my repository and say all categories dot to array. Now, I, there's probably people out there saying, oh my gosh, you don't have to call to array. You could just pass um, just pass the I enumerable and let it query. Well, this is an I queryable, actually. All right, I can just pass that and we'll loop across it. The problem is, if this code crashes, and you don't call to array or something to like snapshot it, then the code will only crash as you process it in the razor file. All right, so my preference is to sort of make sure it runs here. So if I unit test this, it's going to it's going to run basically straight away. So all the real code talking to databases and what services and stuff actually executes all the way on the server rather than waiting for deferred execution somewhere down in the view. It's just my preference. That's why I'm doing it. Okay, but now we'll have the categories, and we could actually do better than this. Um, let's do a lot. <clears throat> let's say from CN here, select new, um, select list item. So what I can work with is this thing called the select list item, which the, <clears throat> excuse me, what the drop-down list wants. So it has two properties, text equals um, c.name and value equals c.id. Um, underscore ID is how it works in MongoDB to string. Okay. Now let's call to array on that. 
new array. Okay? So I can actually pass this in. I could have done that transformation on the razor side, but that seems a little shady to me. So I'm going to drop it down and pass select list items with the right settings. Okay, great. So let's go over add book in here, and we'll pull this out. Now, when you use view model, or sorry, view bag, you have to have the spelling exact. There's no help, right? It's dynamic. So I can say here I have a select list item array categories equals this, and that will do a sort of runtime cast for us. Okay, so the other thing we need is the category. So let's, let's copy that for a minute. I want a drop down list four. Actually, if I had the model, which we'll get to, we could use this one, but because I don't have a model property that has the categories, well, I need to do I need to do this kind. So the name is going to be selected category ID. And it needs to get a select list array like this. Okay. So if we're going to bind to this, we'll see how we have to do it in a moment. But let me just see if everything works here. Look at this. Physics. Of course, it says price here. That's wrong. Physics or science. And maybe we want to uh, do a little bit of uh, work here as well to give them like a, a nothing selected um, one. So you can say um, select one like this as well. I believe that will work. Let's go over here and refresh it. There you go. Select one. Now you get physics or science. Okay? Make sense? Hopefully it does. If you have any questions, throw them in there. But this is bad. What we're doing is bad, but it's going to work. So let's go create a book and put it into one of these categories. So we've got to fix our controller. All right, here's the get part where we had to new up the stuff that was needed for the form to get started. Now we have this post. What do we do? Okay, so we, our model is a book, so we're going to put a book in here. That's our model binding, but we also had extra stuff. We had a, um, with a string, select it. I'm going to copy it because it's a dangerous. But uh, case sensitivity is out the window here, so we don't have to worry about that. All right, so what I want to do is this. I'll say um, book, well, the book's already created, but I need to set the selected category. So I'll say book dot... Um, Category ID. This is a this thing in uh, MongoDB called an object ID. So I've got to sort of do this. Okay. And then I'll say repository dot save and book return redirect. Right. Get post redirect. Redirect to slash. Let's go to the category. Um, uh, let me just remember what my URL for the category was. It is slash category slash name. Books category name. Books slash category slash plus. Now, I, in order to do this, I actually, if I'm going to use the name, i got to look that up. So let's say this. Let's create a little variable here. Uh, hold on. I'll say var cat equals repository dot find category by category ID. And we'll set underscore ID, just to be consistent, and here we'll do cat.name. Make sense? So we post back our data, plus this other randomly sort of associated data we need, and then we're going to do all the work to get the category, update the book, save it, and then we're going to do our get, post, redirect back to what I think is the best place if I'm adding a book to a category, just take me to the categories, or maybe take me to the book, but it doesn't show anything yet, so we'll go to the categories. Brian, I see a question. Yes. Uh, it is, do all viewback properties become automatic properties that you can call on the Razor engine? Should they be called with yes. lowercase? Is that a convention? Oh, good question. So, um... I don't really know whether it should be lowercase or uppercase. I, I would, I've been using uppercase because to me it feels kind of like a public property of the view bag and it looks weird if it's lowercase. But technically this is just a name in a dictionary. However, whatever you choose, it is case sensitive. You can't say capital categories here and lowercase categories there, I don't think. So be really careful. You have to have the spelling just right. I'm sure that you can't misspell it. I'm pretty sure it's case sensitive. It's just a dictionary key as a string, basically. Okay. okay, so let's go ahead and run this and actually see something happen here. 
Okay, so we're going to go and add a book. Let's add a book to Science Cats. Um, add a book. Here we're going to have um, that. I got to switch, but you guys know what it means. Let's uh, find um, Lowell Cats uh, Programmer. That should be a fun picture. Let's say that belongs into our one. Okay. Perfect. So this is going to be our book image URL. This is going to be our book. Uh, yeah. There's our image, and the price is going to be $9.99. Now, if I submit this, it's actually going to crash because there's nothing selected. So we have no validation. That's the next thing we need to do. But let's pick science here. So when I submit this, it should go over here. I'll even I'll put a breakpoint just because we haven't done that yet, so you guys can see. I'm going to submit it. It's going to post back to this page. With way too many windows open. There we go. It's going to post back to this page. And the selected category ID is this value here. It's probably hard to tell, but it's like a GUID, right? It's not empty. If you look at the book, the book has its category ID and regular ID are not, not set yet. It has no comments. But here's its image and its name and its price. You can see it converted to floating point numbers automatically. That's beautiful with the model binding. So we're going to get our category. It seems to be non-empty. It's science. Here's its physics wall cat. All right, set this, save it, and we're going to redirect to science. Here you are, viewing books and category science. And here we got our I can ask programming, All right, programming one, and this. Okay, I see there's no three questions. questions in there? Yeah, bring them on. Yeah. Bring them on. Adam Smith asks, do you still have a browser post data issue when using the back button? No. Um, do you have a, so, I see what you're asking. Not as much. Like, you can see, so, if, it's not like I'm going to get a warning or something if I use the back button, right? So, I'm backwards and forwarding, and it's okay. But I do have the issue if they click this, it will do whatever that did again. Right, so somewhat, I would say it's less of a problem than web forms. Web forms post back for no good reason. Right, the only reason we posted back here is to create the whole, like to do the whole action. Whereas web forms, just because you maybe check a, a, a top use in the box, that might be two post back. So maybe your back button might go through that a couple of times, and it, so it's more broken web forms. But it's you're still you got to be a little careful if this is like e-commerce. Know what I mean? And Ed Magica, silly question, but might this example project be available somewhere after the presentation, or should I yeah, just absolutely. type really quickly? I'm guessing <laughs> no, you can no, no. keep up with you while you're typing in real time. <laughs> sorry, Ed. yeah, sorry. Just as I'm trying to cover so much, I'm going a little fast in the typing. Um, uh, I'm happy to share this with you guys uh, later. Um, Either find me on Twitter or I'll, I'll give it to the Lidno guys and they can post it if there's anywhere that you can post that. Okay. We'll, 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 we'll find some way of making it available for them. And yeah. lastly, Leo asks, can a view have multiple strongly typed models for use with the HTML helpers? If so, how does Razor handle if two models have similarly named properties such as yeah, bootstrap.name versus category.name? Excellent. So um, the answer is no and yes. So <laughs> no, a razor file only gets one one thing at the top, right? So in this add book, I have to put book, or I could put category, but I can't put like book comma category. Okay. So that brings us to our our view model thing, and let's just go ahead and jump into that since that question sort of leads into it. So what I really want to do here is I need to pass more information along than I actually have. Like, I want to pass the, the categories in the book. Now, in a real world, you might also pass the user. You might pass the page you're on. There's all sorts of different aggregations of data that you need to pass. Now, there's two ways in which you might do this, but they both kind of lean on this concept of view models. So this is one way to, uh, to sort of skip past the problem of only being able to assign 
one type to the view because the bag, uh, sorry, the book has no information about its ca all the categories, only the category it's in. But in this world, I gotta have all the categories to put the book into one of them, right? It's kind of like inside out the problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another class, and you can notice uh, if you were in uh, a regular MVC has this models folder. In fact, this model folder to me is like useless. I I've been doing MVC since it was in beta, and I have no idea what goes in that folder. I literally don't. And the problem is that's an MVC, right? This is like the first letter in the acronym of the product, and I don't know what goes there. Because in a real world example, I have a data access layer which has models. And I wouldn't put my data access layer in my website. I'd put that in a separate library. Or if I have services or business objects, that would be separate libraries. So to me, those are the models. And this one is like so useless to me, I just delete it. Or rename it to this thing called view models. Now, view models, um, I can see I forgot to delete some of these. Um, let's delete that one. Actually, I probably didn't want to do that, but that's okay. Um, this is the – that looks great anyway. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to create a class that sort of holds these two things together. Okay, so I want to say create a class here called um, create book view model or something to that effect. Because in here, if I use this as my type, I can have a property called book. Oops if it knew about the type called book. Just call it book. And I can have one called, um, I can, uh, let's say category array called categories, right? And this one thing holds the two pieces of information together, and then I can still use my strongly typed helpers on this type and on this type. Okay, so let's go back and fix up this admin control. All right, it's admin a bit here. So. Let's say instead of doing this, I'm going to do this. View model equals new one of those. And here I'll say view model dot book equals this. And instead of saying view bag categories, I'll say view model dot categories. Oh, and of course that should have been a select list. Select list item. Oops. There you go. It represents categories, but it's not actually categories, right? View model. Okay. Now, of course, I have to update my page over here. This is an ad book. So this one, right, the top needs to be changed. And if you have ReSharper, I think it will actually do it already. Like I just hit Alt-Enter, and it will just make that change for you. So now if I go here, we have our, whoops. And maybe it won't. I'll have to type it. So, there we go. So now this is all broken, right? You can see it says, oh, okay, well, there's no name property, but there's a book.name, and there's a book.url, and there's a book.price. And it, you can nest these as deep as you want. You could say, like, author. you know, go as crazy as you want. And then here, this categories, we're not going to do all this stuff again with a view bag. We're going to go down here and say um, m dot, oops, sorry, in this case it's model dot categories. And we could even go a little farther. And we could say this, we could say drop down list four, and we could go m goes to m dot categories, comma, and then you would give it. Oh, sorry, it needs two things. I need to store the selected category ID as well on my thing up here. So let's say property string. I want to bind all the info together. A selected category. Then it wants the list of them. Um, model dot uh, categories. And we can do our select one or something like that. Okay. And provided I got this all right. We should now be able to have just a single uh, single model that lets us do strongly typed stuff in the same way that you were asking, but not exactly. Um, yeah, so hold on. I know I should have deleted that just a second. Let me grab this back from um, documents, projects. 
web maybe in there kind of already model. okay sorry about that good. I knew I shouldn't have deleted that one. I apologize about that. So now remember what we did is we switched from having a bunch of like unrelated data or sort of loosely associated data in our ad book to now having one single object that has part of it as a book and part of it has this. So let's go add another one to physics. Let's call this um, low code 1.2. Um, let's go find another little cat programming. There we go. Oops, this one would be perfect. Copy image URL. There's this image. This one is quite pricey at $19.99, and we'll go create it. Now, I realize that as I'm about to press this, there's going to be a problem, so I'm not pressing it yet. If we go back to our admin controller, we updated this this part here, and actually, I suppose, no, it wouldn't work, because we changed some, some names. So, remember, we had these two pieces, because that was as close as we could get with our form post to existing objects that we knew about. But now I can just do this um, model here, and I can say, if we might have to tweak this a little bit, select a category ID, and here we'll say model.book.categoryID. You can save that. Okay, so let's run this in the debugger just to make sure we're doing things right. I see there's a few questions. Just a moment, we'll, we'll take them. Okay, so let's see if our form post worked out. So here we have a book. We have a selected category. The categories was not stored in the form, so it was not resubmitted. But if we open up our book, you can see that it has the, all the stuff set. So we can have these complex sort of nested objects, and it's all good. Okay, so here you go. Now we have our low code 1.2. Uh, don't worry, I, I'm from tech support. All right, questions? I see there's two. Sorry, yes, uh, you do see, right? Just bear with me a second. No, I love the questions. It's great. Um, I was waiting for you to uh, have a break in the presentation, but I drifted yeah, away from the screen for a second there. No, um, Spence asks, how did you create the cat ID? Was it done in MongoDB? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just like, great question. So just like in any framework, the book ID is null here. After you call save, it gets updated. It's like an auto-incrementing, auto-generated, database-generated ID. Yeah. yeah Same and you have, another ID. you have another question from Ed Magica. If you wanted to store the nifty lolcat images in your repository and expose, will the dynamic model binding be okay with the encoded binary data, i.e. will it render correctly in the client? Yeah, so, sure. So what I would do, I mean, there are ways to Im actually literally embed, like, Base64 encoded images into HTML, but that's kind of non-standard. Normally you have, like, a link to an image. So what I would do is when you add this, this uh, has a model, whoops, this is a model.book.image URL. What I would do is I would, you know, somehow either make them post that as a file, in which case you get the bytes, or, you know, maybe download that from the, uh, from the URL they give you and store it in, in the book, and then have a separate action that is like, given a book ID, pull out its image out of the database and return that as a binary stream. So that's how I would do it. And lastly, Brian Cummings asks, friends, I've been looking forward to this talk for some time, but I've, oh, hang on. Will a recording be available for review later? That one crept in. I'll answer that one. I apologize yeah, no for worries. that. Yes, so the answer yes, is yes, it will. Yeah. Yes, it will be. It'll be on our Lidnug page along with um, all of our other recordings. Um, that's Excellent. it for now, Michael. All right, great, thanks. Okay, so let's go back here. We have our 
our, our things are coming along well. We've got our various categories. You saw that we added the form for categories, and that was straightforward. We added the form for book, and that was less straightforward, but still not a huge problem. We started out by finding a book and then using some like side loading through view bag or view data, and that was kind of wrong. We said, stop doing that. That's wrong. So then we actually said, all right, well, let's create this thing called a view model that aggregates the data. And, and then we used one of those to create our lolcat spec book here. Now, there's some other problems. I could go over here and I could say add Sorry. a category. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Michael. Can I just uh, interject there? Robin says, can you please show your view once where you are showing image and price in dollars? Yes, I do. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what he means by that. Oh, oh I see, I see what you're <laughs> So um, what he's talking about, I believe, is there's a a view here that shows a given uh, book or category, and it shows a, a link to it, and it, here's the picture, and here's the link, and then here's the name, and here's the price in dollars. Hopefully that answers your question. So you saw in, um, in my category, category, CS, I just have a for each loop. And it says for each book in the category, just show the single book. And that thing I just showed you is this view, this little partial sub view. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, so there's a problem though. Like if I click this, that's less awesome. Broken cat, as in category, but I guess it ties well to my cat theme as well, is, is a problem. There should be something that says, hey, don't do that. This is required. Why are you submitting this, right? And um, web forms had some freaky, awful ways of doing various validation stuff, whatnot. But with MVC, we have some really fantastic ways to do this. So let's just go back over to our admin controller, which is here. Let me clean things up a little. Okay. Now we have this create book view model. And now here's something that's pretty awesome. I can go over here to say this selected category is required. And that uses system not component model dot data, data annotations namespace to say this. Okay, and I can also say that um, if I go to my book down here, whoops, there's uh, some reasons you might not do this, right? You might not put this on your, um, whoops, that is not what I'm looking for. Let's do an add reference to the right one. So you can see it's not quite what you would do, but mm, hold on. Data annotations. There you go, that one. That. So I can also say this about these various things here. Now technically it doesn't really mean much for the price the way it's written right now, but let's go and, and run this again. Now if I try to go create one of these books or categories to it actually this was just the create category wasn't it let's go to the add category one just down and here we'll just say this is required as well as this we can add other things like regular expressions and you know length and all that kind of stuff so let's go and try to create a new category now now you might think what i did is going to help not helping Oh, I have the client-side stuff turned on. So um, if I didn't have the client-side bits turned on, there's a, some uh, JavaScript that's included, this part right here will still run, right? Barring the fact that maybe some JavaScript caught it, this, this is not enough to protect us. You actually need to do a little bit of code in the beginning to make sure you're ready to sort of save this object. Can you save this? If model state dot is valid, you want to you want to ask that question. And typically, I ask it in reverse because you want to bail out of the method straight away. Say if not, we'll just say return uh, view of category. Whatever they typed in, send those same values back. But don't um, don't uh, accept it and process it. So if we want to do validation, it's sort of two steps. We can go to our objects and say these fields are required. And then in our post back, we need to make sure we check it because 
There's some of those attributes that can be checked on the client, but not all of them. All right. And there's, like I said, there's a bunch, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a link for some more here in just a little bit. Okay, so now I should not be able to submit this invalid category. You can see it's actually lighting up the thing. If I take this away, do them both, and if I type, you can see it goes away. And that's all the client side stuff. But as I type, it's you know coming and going. Really nice feedback. So in order to get that to work, uh, let me pull up uh, the slides, and we'll just do a little bit of catch up here. So let me jump ahead. I showed you a few things. We'll skip over. But here's the validation. So on our book view model, we said these various things are required. Okay. And we can even actually add messages if we want. Um, there's just uh, another HTML helper, HTML.validation message for m goes m dot text or m goes m dot name something like that and that's what's generating these things on the right but uh, just the fact that the fields are invalid are making them red and that's cool um, so let's see yeah so here's the client size bit so if you want to have this run on the client and the server right it's not enough to just run it on the client alone. You know, somebody could have JavaScript off. There could be somebody trying to hack your site, all these kinds of things. So you want to make sure you have JavaScript there to make it a nice user experience, but you can't rely on it. So so MVC is awesome in that it does both. If you turn off JavaScript, it just does the same validation on the server. right? But in order to do it, you need to have this in your web config, client-side validation on, unobtrusive JavaScript on, pull in these four JavaScript files in order, and then just use the attributes on your classes for model binding. So, so we have a validation it. question. Yeah, absolutely. Bring it on. Yep. How do you implement conditional validations? I mean, consider using the same model yeah. on different pages where the validation requirements are different. Sure. Or if it's just something more complicated than a single attribute will will enable. So there's a couple of things you can do. Um, one, one is up here. Yes. Okay. So one is I wrote this blog post on open source validation projects, and also somebody uh, contacted me yesterday and pointed out a really nice one as well. So there's um, the built-in ones are like compare, data type, max length, min length. They're actually pretty crummy besides required. However, you can derive from validation attribute and create your own and do all sorts of stuff. So one that's pretty cool is this thing called foolproof. And if you look at this one, they've got uh, cool stuff like is not equal to, not equal to, greater than, less than. And then here's some of the conditional stuff required if not empty, uh, if not. Right, so I could say something like this field is required if your country is not United States. Something like that. All right, so you can do a little bit of conditional stuff here. And there's some other ones as well, data annotation extensions and a few others. Uh, there's fluent validation, which is the one that the guy I spoke to yesterday brought up. That was really nice, slightly different. But um, you can do this as well. You could say something like this. If, oops, I would do it in the wrong other order. I would say if, um, let's say category.name equals no, something like that. And I'll say... Um, model state dot add model whoops add model error um, the key will be name and the error will be no not no something like that so you can have two equal signs and you can do all sorts of code whatever code you want to write here and then you use this thing to sort of pass it back into the same system so if I run this I can create a category as long as it's not no exclamation mark so let's go try to create a category again. So we have two more questions. Do you want me to ask them now, or um, should we leave them for a while? Because they're not directly related to where you are. Okay. Um, give me just a few minutes to move forward, then we'll come to them. Okay. No so, so you can tell that if I leave this empty, it's a problem. But if I put in no, it's going to come back and still say, you know, no, that's an error, right? It won't let me do that. But if I put no, no, like that, and little cat's image. Let's just copy this this picture really quick so we have an image. Whoops. 
All right, here's the one that it let in, but if I had just regular no, it doesn't. So hopefully that, that addresses your question in that you can write all sorts of code. This is like random code. I can have this as complex and interrelated, and it could be from like a base class library uh, or like a shared library or validation library or whatever, as long as it calls that. Right, maybe pass the model state, and it could just add model errors or whatever. You can go as advanced as you want. And if you do that before you ask this question, the answer will be no if you've added a model error. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question. All right, what are the other two questions, quickly? Right, so the other two. Um, Ed Magica, again, has... Obviously, no data view grid exists in MVC, and you would build the equivalent via HTML. What HTML helpers and or techniques might you recommend for this common UI need? Yeah, yeah, good question. So there, the question is, like, more generally, how do I replace the controls that I got that I depended upon? Right? Like, grids are really obvious because they're complicated, but calendars, too. The answer is usually some sort of JavaScript instead. So I would do, there is something built into MVC, but I would do, let me trim this sucker down a little. Okay, I would go and look for, I think it's JQ Grid. Is that it? Oops, JQ Grid Demos, how about that? So let's go here. All right, so here's a grid that you can get with paging, you know, multiple paging, sorting, all these different things. And in order to write this, like this is the, you just basically set it up. I mean, all we're doing is more or less setting up the, the columns and the properties in jQuery. So if somebody said go do a grid, I would do I would do something like this or one of the, you know, maybe a Telerik grid or they've got some nice grids as well. I, I would use JavaScript. And um, jQuery UI also has quite a bit of nice stuff. So, um if you go like date picker, like a complaint might be, well, you know, there's no, there's no calendar. How am I going to do this? Well, you know, that's a pretty nice calendar right there, right, that you could work with. And if you actually view view the source of it, right, this is literally the code that you write. So, more generally, how do you deal with these things that are missing? There's usually a really slick and nicer way to do that already on the web. Like this is a much nicer experience compared to. Uh, the, the current calendar control that you've got in web forms, right? But it just takes a little bit of looking outside the platform. That's that's what I would say for that. Yeah, yeah, that that would be my choice as well. My second choice is um, Knockout JS. Yeah, 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 yeah do absolutely. I'll view a model with Knockout JS and a template. Um, Bill Alvin asks, how would you deal with display-only fields when you do validation this way? I believe when you return the view object, the non-editable and the non-editable fields are returned as null. I think you they are to right, 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 right. Well, uh, okay. So, good question. So you can basically, um, yeah, I hear what you're saying. So what I would do is, I would actually use a a view model that didn't actually sort of have this nested stuff in here, but if I just wanted to edit the name and the image, but not the ID, I would just have I would just have name and image as properties here, and then I would copy them over, right? And one thing that I, we won't have time to get to on the slides, but is here is so um, if you if you post this data in, right, you got to copy it over from like a, a view model here. I, I said DTO, but like a view model. Right, you got to copy these over, and that's kind of painful. So you can set up like an auto mapper relationship through your view model and your other object. So what you might do is you might go and get your book from the database where it has all the fields, and then use some auto mapper relationship to copy like four or five fields over that are the changed fields, but won't touch the ones that were like not meant to be passed. So. You know, another another thing that is uh, related to this that that is worth going into is maybe we have. Uh, I'll spend just two minutes on this. Is suppose our our um, we had some other uh, some other input here. Let me just go to the home controller and just go create another action method here. Let's call this a temp. Suppose I have a class here as well. 
Uh, so this will just be uh, some temp object, right? This will be that we want to work with here, and we'll just say it's got a an int age and and uh, rule is admin. So it feels like extra work to do all this, like passing around the view models and stuff that I was talking about. Um, but what you'll see is there's actually a serious security problem that you're going to need to look out for. So if, if you've got a setup like this with your get post redirect, okay, and you have your model binding, turn, let me just say, and the admin. There we go. And apparently this needs to be public. Okay. So suppose we have this form that takes this thing. So let me just add a view really quick. Um, it's going to be uh, some temp object. And here we've got a form, HTML, not begin form. And all you want to do is put in here is a at text uh, HTML dot text box four m goes to m dot age. You want to be able to say set your age. So let's say age equals this. Age equals this, and then let's give it a button update. Okay. Slight diversion here, but um, temp was home slash temp. All right, so we're going to update the age. And let me actually update this so it also puts out the, the age. M plus age. And if I say my age is 40 and I hit enter, it's going to say M40 and admin false. Okay, go back. So here's here's the problem. If you if you bind to more data, more properties than your form intends, that doesn't mean that people can't mess with them. Like what if I go over here and just say something super simple? Question mark is admin equals true. All right, so that seemed to work. Um, now if I post this back and say now I'm 40, is admin is true? That should raise some serious red flags. There is a you know this is called a, a mass vulnerability. Uh, mass assignment vulnerability, and basically, when you talk about model binding, the model data, the properties come from four locations. Um, the most important three are first the form posts, the route data, and query parameters, those types of things, and they just sort of aggregate. So this is like I could hack the system, and you know, basically, like I could change the price of my book to free as I'm buying it, and then set it back or something crazy like that. So if you start binding directly to your objects, you you may end up in this situation, and that's a problem. So there's, you know, even though it seems like more work to do this view model stuff and like sort of copy things around and, and sort of, you know, uh, don't avoid directly binding to your objects, which would you know immediately solve the problem of like things that are read only, right? Um, this this will this will also protect you against mass assignment vulnerabilities. If what we had done is something like name, image, price, and categories, rather than um, having a book directly in there. So anyway, it's just it's a bit of a diversion. It's at the end of the slides, but it's something you want to be careful about. All right, I have one more thing I want to cover, but if there's any questions on that, I'll, I'll take them before we move on. No, no questions yet. All right, excellent. So let's go check out a cat here. Uh, sorry, a book in science. Let's check out the low code book. Okay, um, so suppose, let's go over here to our um, views, our books. Actually, we want our book controller. Now, this show, this is going to show stuff about our book, so let's just do this. This is going to be an object ID, just like we had before. So let's just say a book B equals new, oh, not a new book, repository dot find book. New object ID ID. Okay. Return view B. Okay, so we're not going to do too much fancy stuff, but I do want to show you one thing that you can do here. Oops. 
Let's show and book. I have the, the name right. Let's see. Show, show. Yes, okay. Oh, I didn't want to actually do that. Let's go do one more thing again. So one thing you can do, it's not always helpful, but uh, sometimes it's good when you're getting started to see how this stuff works, is you can actually use this scaffolding thing here. This script reference is fairly useless, but um, this is cool. I can say, here's a details view of my book, and it'll actually build out all the pieces that are read-only, or I can say editor or whatever, so let's just do that. And just to show you what happens there. So here it'll actually show you all the various uh, pieces. And then this one, I would rather not display it this way, but let's do this one. Is, it's just going to show a text field, but I want actually an image source equals, oops, like that. So now if we go look at a book, like this one, you can see here's my book. All right, so name, it's low code, image, price. Now, if we have somewhere like uh, some comments or something in the bottom, like maybe you want to have, um, not this stuff at the bottom, but maybe you want to have a comment section where people can put in comments. Um, we'll just have like a, let's say, I'll put a div so it works right, comment at html.txt box, text area four. And we'll just leave this, uh, let's just say text area comment. Okay, so if I run this and I go back to my thing, you can see now here's a comment and I put a semicolon that I shouldn't have. I could type in a comment here and we could post it back, right? And we would show it just like we are here. But what if I write this script slash script, you know, and here I do like, hack this, right, you know, something like alert, alert high, right, that's a problem, right, because then I can go and sort of mess up the, the page, I could hack the users who are visiting the page, I could try to steal their information, right, steal their logon or their username or whatever, right, so I have a couple of choices, when you're actually showing the data back, if you use this at sign here, like here it's saying at model.image, it actually encodes the data. Now, if I really wanted to show whatever they typed, if it's like a CMS, I could I could show, I could I could use this version. I could say at HTML dot um, raw at model, uh, whoops, just model dot image or, or whatever, and that'll put whatever they typed in there will come out and show as HTML. So that's like kind of dangerous, right? That's a problem. But what if you want to let your users actually enter interesting data, like rich data? So what if you want to have them be able to like bold stuff and put images and you know like a forum or something? How do you how do you clean these things up? So you know this sort of default way to display stuff in Razor is safe, but not not engaging. Whereas this HTML raw I just deleted is engaging but not safe. So uh, let me flip ahead a little bit here. I'll show you a picture. So basically, we have um, three options. We could use this model.value, right? That's safe, but doesn't look very good. We could use HTML.raw, which is unsafe but looks good, but you kind of do that, you know, intentionally and you claim that. And if you were calling, like, some class, right, if you return a MVC HTML string, it'll be raw. If you return a regular string, it'll be like the top type. So, you know, how do you deal with this this kind of stuff, right? If you want to have interesting comments, but you don't want to uh, basically open up your users to being hacked, what do you do? So, Markdown. The thing that you want to use is this thing called Markdown. And there's a .NET library called Markdown Deep, which lets you uh, do this. So, I don't know if I have a reference to that or not, but let me just show you guys. Uh, actually, let's look here. It doesn't appear to be there. So we can do this. We can say, go to NuGet and say, mark down. There's a couple of options here. If I were searching online, there would be a couple of options. Mark down. Um, there's mark down sharp, mark down deep. And you want the .NET and JavaScript version, so you have client and server side. So we can install this. Of course, we agree to whatever the licenses are. Okay, so close that. 
And now if I, there's a little bit of code that you got to run here. Let me go and pull up my Google Docs really quick because there's like three things you got to set up, and they're really simple. But rather than trying to look it up in the docs, let me just go here. So basically the three things you have to do is you have to put this little block of stuff in there. So you have to have like a certain class for the toolbar, a certain uh, style for your editor, and then like this little preview window. So if I go and I replace this thing with that, okay, and then I include a certain CSS file in my layout, and if I include a JavaScript file for the preview, Let's go over here to our views, shared, layout. Let's put that here. Let's put our JavaScript at the bottom. So I think that should do it, actually. So if we rerun this, what do we get? Oh, our uh, editor isn't great. Where is the toolbar, I believe? Must be some JavaScript error about uh, including. Let's see, make sure that our JavaScript is named right. Sorry, MDD styles. That looks good. Put it on opening. I'm not sure what's going on, but anyway, uh, not worth figuring out right now. I'll just tell you guys about it. So basically, um, if you just include those things and figure out whatever mismatches with my CSS or my, I think it's actually the JavaScript, it's not running correctly. Oh, sorry, I know what it is. There's one more thing we got to do down here. I don't want to do this somewhere else, but. Save as dollar sign document dot ready. You say markdown d dot, I believe it's in knit. There you go. No? Okay. Sorry. Must have done it wrong. But anyway, um, you just call basically a JavaScript function to set this up, and it will, it will give you this rich editor, which is Markdown, which is safe, 100% safe. So you can let users create, like, rich formatting, you know, bold, italics, indentation, uh, code, whatever. Basically, whatever you can do at Stack Overflow, and then they post that back. And then when you show it, you just have to call this function on the Markdown deep library from, to say, turn this Markdown into HTML. So I want to make sure that you guys can sort of... You know, take actual interesting input and show it. Uh, I see there's a question, Brian. Yes, yeah, there is. Or, um, if it's Martin, I can. I, oh, we have an unmuted member there. Hang on one second. There we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, all of us did. <laughs> Uh, Philip Wells asks, well, actually, I say he asks, he, uh, he's making more of a statement. I think it's based on what you were on about before when you were on about picking up form values. Mm -hmm. And he states, I had a situation where I had an ID in a URL and an ID in a form field. The model binding yes. used the one in the URL even with the form body in the post. Any idea how I would have been able to for, force it to use the ID in the body? Or can I not make that decision? Yeah, the order happens, uh, the order happens in a very uh, a certain way. So, wherever my presentation, I think I closed my presentation, sorry. Open it up again. So in the slide, somewhere I have the order in which this happens. Here. So it first comes from, yeah, I believe it should come from the form first, I believe. 
But um, if for some reason you wanted to force it, you could always go and just grab the forms data here. So if I go here, I could say like, uh, let me find one that has some kind of post back here. I could say request dot form of like ID or something like that. So you could grab that explicitly and set it right at the beginning. Um, it's I don't know how to make the model binding change its order. It's possible that you can do it. I have never tried it and I haven't heard of it being done. So I'm not sure if that's possible, but you can always directly snatch it from the form if you need to. So it's not a great answer, but it's, it, would, it would give you something to work with. Well, I mean, you can't, you can't override little... the model binding engine altogether. You potentially could do something, but I'd be hesitant to change that globally. Yeah, I I tend to um, I I often don't rely on the model binding myself. I tend to use um, Ajax string or Ajax in jQuery, mm -hmm. and yeah. I yeah I send the I send them in myself. Um, Ed Magica asks another question. Worst case scenario, could a person intercept the model binding for a method? Yes, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure you can. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head how to do it, but I'm pretty sure that you can do it. So, yeah, I believe the answer is yes. I think you can get in there and like hook. Okay. So if I go here, I can say like override. I think you also do this globally, right? On executing, basically. Right, so you might be able to do something in there with it as well. But um, I think there's a, gl a global place where you can customize the model binder. I know right now. I know what I'm looking for, by the way. Well, I think you've got about another five go. minutes, Michael. Yeah, great. Okay, so I just called the wrong JavaScript function. Here is your rich input and you come in here to control B, you know, control I, control L and get a URL, like all the stuff that you can do with code, you can, you know, indent this and so on. So, sorry about that, that I had messed that up, but um, basically you can just uh, set up these, these little uh, text areas and, you know, make it uh, more dynamic and sizing by calling... Uh, markdown deep on the actual thing using jQuery. So jQuery plugin. Well, if it's any interest, if it's any interest, you've just converted a tiny MCE user to where uh, Markdown tonight. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> awesome! Yeah, you know, I, we looked at MC, but, uh, MC editor or whatever, but it's just not it. Markdown is so simple and it's clear what you can do and can't do, and you have to like protect against any edge cases. It's 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 a beautiful thing. So, all right. Um, Let's see, I do have one final thing, and then I'll take any other questions, I suppose. So let me just um, sort of give you the, the summary. All right, so we talked a little bit about single-page apps. These things are a highly evolving. Um, uh, just search single-page applications. There's some new uh, stuff coming in, the MVC templates and all sorts of stuff that's nice. So just in conclusion, we saw that we started out with HTML helpers, and that created things like the text boxes and drop-down lists and things like that. And it looked, well, like, okay, maybe this is for people who don't know how to write input, you know, tags in HTML. But we saw that all the stuff that follows builds on top of it. So model binding sort of makes that simpler and safer. And you do, like, a refactor, rename, and resharper, it'll refactor your forms as well. And you add on unobtrusive validation, client-side and server-side validation, a few models that just, it all builds into this really sweet form capability in MVC. And hopefully uh, you guys saw that. And as you pointed out there uh, in the comments, um, because it's a JavaScript-friendly environment, you may decide to completely skip some of this form post stuff. And on some of your forms that are more user interactive and more important, you might switch those to just jQuery and JavaScript or Knockout and, and JavaScript and just post those back to the server. 
Okay, so um, last thing is at Developmentor, we have an online learning platform as well, and we have a course on there called Accepting User Input in MVC, which is apparently seven hours and 17 minutes long, which I wrote, and uh, you can see the URL at the bottom there, learninglineapp.com slash c slash 11. So if you want to take this in a more deep, full-featured version as a hands-on course, then go there and check that out. And for you guys at Lidnug, uh, the first, let's say, 20 people that send me an email or something or contact me you know, through my blog, which is michaelckennedy.net here, then um, I'll give you a free free pass to that class or whatever. So thanks for coming. And I see there's at least one more question, but, you know, let bring on any questions you have and then we'll wrap it up yep fantastic Michael um, thanks I've got to admit I've learned a couple of things myself there um, awesome so, so it, 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 it's nice to know that um, the knowledge is still out there to be shared um, excellent we, we love having good presentations especially highly technical ones like that with a lot of coding and fantastic um, the remaining question uh, that looks amazing, Markdown, that is. Can the content from the text area Markdown be saved directly to a database and then repopulated from the database the same way with no, with no modifications required on the developer's part? Yeah, it's um, Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks so much for that incredible functionality. Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt. So I just talked about this learning line thing. Um, uh, here we go. Let's go. Here's a course I was telling you about. If we have these sort of built-in editors, and this is where all the, a lot of this stuff came from, building this site. So if you go here see this little edit thing, you guys don't have this because you're not admins. But nonetheless, click that. It switches straight to a markdown, and we just save this to and from the database. And, you know, I can come down here and make changes, and then it goes right back. But you can see here's the bolded list. Here's bold. Here's, like, our inline code. All of that stuff is just going to and from the database, just as is. And when we render it, we call that field dot to markdown to HTML, basically, rather than just showing it as raw text. And then we sh then we do an HTML dot raw on the output of that that conversion. But because all you can ever type in here is like bold italics, image, just the basics that you can do in Markdown, it's totally safe. There's no there's no script. Like if I put script in there, you'll see that it would just say the word script in my UI, right? Mm -hmm. For example, this form is, is not actually a form down here. It's just like a, this thing. So anyway, that's uh, that's where the Markdown tip comes from for you guys. Right, so, so we, have one, we, we have enough time for one last question before we turn off the recording, I think. Um, Andre right. asks... Can you tell me a little bit about temp data? Temp data. Okay. So temp data. So I try to avoid temp data because it seems a little, uh, it, it's a little uh, funky, but it's a place where you can store data in one page so that another page or, or view or whatever has access to it. Right. So like if I, if I, go in and say, I want to learn about this course, and you, you check a box, and then it redirects you over somewhere else in the site to actually start to tell you about it. If you had chosen some options about that, you could, like, store those options in temp data and then pull them out and share them over there. It's kind of like session, except for once you read it, it's gone, where session is, like, permanent until you log out, right? So it's like a, a place to drop data, and as soon as you read it, it vanishes. It's like a passing in the letter uh, of information or, or something like that. But um, it's it's a key feature is that once you read it, it's gone, I believe, right? Like I said, I haven't done very much with it. So that's my, my best answer for you. Right. Well, that's fantastic. Um, once again, thank you very much, Mayo. Fantastic presentation. Right. Yeah, thanks. And thanks um, for ho the Hopefully, we'll have you along again soon. With um, yeah. some more presentations. Uh, yeah, yeah I'll you know. some more MVC. And, and to all our members that are still out there, don't forget about the Lidnub Code competition. Come on, guys, this thing is absolutely huge. It's global competition. Your country needs you. Come and get yourself on the leaderboard. <laughs> Show your country what you're made of.
show your country why you're the greatest developers out there and win some awesome swag in the process. Um, the link's bit.ly forward slash code comp. Or just come along to the Lidnug group on the LinkedIn platform and bug one of us in there and we'll happily tell you all about it. Um, until next time, stay cool, keep coding, and don't do anything we wouldn't do. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks again.